All right, Elise, it's one o'clock. Let's get started. Okay. All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. This is uh, really exciting for Gary and I, um, as we've been working on launching this idea for, um, I don't know, maybe about six months or even longer. Um, so you're, you all get to participate in the first um, uh, seminar in the Clinical Faculty Development Series 101 delivered by the Alliance for Clinical Education. Um, and today we're going to be really focusing on sort of Clerkship 101 and the roles of Clerkship leadership and the logistics of running um, the clinical course. And while we'll spend some of our time, you know, focused on the clerkship director and sort of the leadership, we also want to look at this through the lens of the clinical faculty that teach in the course. Um, and I was supposed to have Shireen Madani Sims as my sidekick today, who wrote one of the chapters that we're sort of um, using as the basis of our um, of our talk, but she's stuck in Iceland. And so I've recruited Jill Sutton uh, and Celeste Royce who are gonna be joining um, us this morning or this afternoon here on the East Coast. For some of you, it's still morning. So just to um, uh, start us out, we, none of us have any disclosures. You know, we're all educators. We do this for free, whether that's the right, right way or the wrong way. Um, I just want to sort of um, introduce the idea that Gary and I and ACE have been working on. And so it's a three part series, a 101, 201, 301, with the goal to really provide faculty development to a broader audience. Um, so not just clerkship directors, um, but those who are interested in clinical medical student education, um, including students themselves, residents, fellows, um, and faculty at both academic and community um, centers. So it's a three year series. Each year we're planning on nine webinars. So we're not doing webinars in December, July and August, just busy months and uh, nice to have a break. Uh, there's CME credit provided for each hour. It's scheduled to be the second Thursday of the month on 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and virtual via Zoom. Um, and it's sort of based off the guidebook for clerkship directors, the fifth edition. Um, but again, we really are using a lens of just approaching all clinical faculty rather than just focusing on the clerkship directors themselves. Um, so this is our 101 series. This is what we have planned for the upcoming year. And you're here on September 9th for the um, roles and logistics of running the clerkship. Um, but you can see we have lots of good topics coming um, your way. So how to create curriculum, what are the different types of instructional methods, how to teach and assess clinical reasoning. So lots of um, exciting things coming your way. And then next year, we're getting into a little more complicated um, topics, some more cutting ed edge curriculum topics like integrating basic science, um, interprofessional education, health system science, um, things like that. And then when we get to 301, once you're all uh, experts, we're going to really tackle the challenges of things like professionalism, uh, ethical physicians, wellness, lifelong learning, uh, accreditation, how to make a career out of being a medical educator, um, things like that. Um, and again, you can get CME credit for each hour you do. You get a certificate if you complete 70% of any of the series and then 70% of all three series. So um, we're really excited. Um, and so today, again, just basing this off of the guidebook, I, I got stuck with the three, um, you know, kind of bread and butter, maybe little less interesting topics, but I have Jill and Celeste here. So we're gonna liven it up, I'm sure. Um, so we're gonna be kind of reviewing like the role of the clerkship director, which I think it's important for clerkships or directors to understand the role, but I think it's also important for students and residents and faculty to really have a good understanding of the breadth that this um, position holds and um, all of the roles that they have and all of the things that they're doing to provide the best clinical experience. We're gonna talk a little bit about just the day-to-day -day challenges that come up in the clerkship and we're gonna be really interested in how some of you solve some of these challenges. So. Um, there will be some audience participation. Um, and then we're going to talk about the clerkship orientation and just how important that is, both for students, but also for residents and for um, faculty to be oriented to the clerkship to really have a successful experience 
So um, here we go. And just to give credit to the authors of um, the first chapter in the book, which is um, the role of the clerkship director written by Renee Betancourt and Catherine Margo. So we wanna be sure to give them kudos for their um, hard work. So our objectives for this first third of the um, session is we're just gonna really try to understand what the roles of the clerkship director are. And we'd love to hear from some of you, um, some of the things you're doing, um, uh, you know, best practices for a successful clerkship director. What are some challenges you've had? Um, and really work together on um, how to create the best experience. So the first thing that we want to do is to have you take a minute and just type your name and your institution um, and the role that you play and the number of years you've been in that role in the chat. And this will just give us a sense of sort of who our audience is, which is um, important data for Gary and I to know as we move forward so we can target these more appropriately to the audience. Um, so while you're doing that, I will just say, you know, my name's Elise Everett and I'm a gynecologic oncologist by training and I'm up here in the north at the University of Vermont, which is near Canada. Um, and I'm the level director of the clinical clerkships, which means I oversee our eight core clerkships in the third year of our curriculum. And I've been in that role exactly the same amount of time that the COVID pandemic has been going on. So one and a half years. So needless to say, um, I took the job at a, a very interesting time. Um, so we're just going to hear from you and just see um, who all of you are. Wow. Great. This is awesome. Great job, y'all. Excellent. So we're really excited. Um, it looks like we have a nice breadth of people. We've got coordinators, we've got boot camp directors, we've got clerkship directors, we've got um, intercession directors, so lots of um, different levels of experience. So I think this is great. Um, and I think what we'll find is that a lot of these things overlap all of these positions. Um, and so we'll really try and keep a, a broad perspective. So my next question to all of you is what has been your biggest challenge in your role? So um, as a clerkship faculty member, as the director of whatever it is that you do, um, and if you want to think about it a different way, tell us in the chat what you want to get out of this session. Like, why did you take an hour out of your day today to hear someone from Vermont? <laughs> so, and that'll help us as we go through the rest of the session today to make sure that we're meeting your goals. Great. I'm seeing lots of good things. Disseminating information, engaging private practice, really lots of good challenges. Faculty buy-in. Awesome. This is great. Okay. Fantastic. Keep typing away as I talk and we'll make sure that um, uh, we capture all of this. It'll be helpful for us as we plan future programming. So then lastly, the last question I want to have you ask, and we'll do this one a little differently, is um, in a show of hands, so you can either raise your hand like the old fashioned way, or if you're tech savvy, you can raise your hand through Zoom and let us know how many of you actually had training before you started your position. Like how many of you had a very clear idea of what your job description was, what your roles were gonna be, and somebody sort of taught you or how to do your job. So um, how many would raise their hand to that? Yeah. I'm not seeing a lot of hands raised. Are you? Not. Okay. Very, I don't see any. I see a sad face. Oh man. Okay. So no one's hand raised. So this is what we're trying to change. <laughs> so you've just proven my point, which is good. That could have gone poorly had you all raised your hand, but um, I, I was feeling pretty confident that none of you were going to raise your hand. So 
this is what we're trying to change. This is what we're trying to do with this session and with this series is to say like, education is a skill and we need to be teaching that skill to our students, teaching it to our residents, teaching it to our faculty and um, how we learn these things like LCME accreditation, it needs to be taught. Um, and we're hoping that through this, we can reach not that we're not reaching only clerkship directors, but we're reaching all of you in all of your numerous roles. Um, so that's what we're going to hope to to begin on this journey with you today. So, um, all right, so we're going to talk about the multiple roles of a clerkship director. Again, I think a lot of these roles are going to overlap with some of your other um, jobs that some of you described. Um, and I lumped these roles, there's two slides on the roles, and these, this is the role of um, jobs where I feel like I'm pulling my hair out, where nobody actually told me that this was some of the things I was going to be doing. Um, so things like LCME compliance, um, when I came in 10 years ago as a um, clerkship director, I didn't actually know what LCME meant. Um, and so again, having, I would have been nice for me to know that this was part of my job and it would have been nice for somebody to maybe say, well, here, you should read the data collection instrument, the DCI and have an understanding of what the standards are and the elements are that relate to running a clerkship and how this plays into governing, um, a clerkship. It would have made me understand, you know, all the rules and regulations as to why, I had to supervise the students or why there were duty hours restrictions. Um, so um, one of the other jobs is school compliance. So again, not something that was on my radar as part of my job. And again, just somebody saying like, hey, you're in charge of the clerkship policies. You're, you need to know what these policies are. You need to make ones following these policies. So even been given the student handbook to read would have been really, really helpful. Um, and then tech. So I am not tech savvy, but there is a lot of tech that happens to make a good clerkship or course run um, in terms of where are you storing your um, didactic material on the website? Um, what software are you using? For, um, how are you, what software are you using for lotteries to determine who goes to clinical sites? Um, again, not something that I was aware of was part of my job. Not, I did not have relationships with the tech group. Um, and it would have been really helpful to spend a day with a clerkship administrator, really understanding how the, all these different technology pieces and logistical pieces fit together and who, um, who does what and who helps with what. Um, and then the last thing that I had no, still don't have a lot of experiences in budget. Um, and so again, meeting with somebody or having a um, mentor um, who could help with understanding the budget and um, understanding how, um, the, where the money goes, you know, how it flows as it relates to education would have been very helpful. And I put career advising on here, not because it makes me pull my hair out. I love career advising. I love writing letters of recommendation. I love the UME to GME transition. Um, but again, it was like an add-on. It was just like, well, you have this job and you're going to do this. And it takes a lot of time to do it well. Um, and it's not, you know, part of your FTE. So I put it here with my hair, pulling my hair out um, because again, it, it's just another added thing that wasn't really preparing for. Um, so I wanna hear from all of you in terms of how are some of you overcoming um, the, this challenge of having a job with all these different roles and how do you teach students, residents, faculty, clerkship leadership about the rules and the regulations that are sort of governing the things that you're doing in your curriculum. So I'm just, we want to open it to the group. Um, feel free just to unmic yourself and comment or comment in the chat or raise your hand and we'll call on you, whichever feels uh, safe. And I'd love to hear what some of you are doing um, as it relates to education in this area. 
We have a comment in the chat from Rolanda Whitford, straight out of ECU, um, oftentimes using grand rounds as a way to get this information out. Any other ideas on how people are distributing things? Ooh, sorry about that. So I can tell, I can give you a few. There's another one in the chat. Um, faculty manual, orientation manual on the internal website, email, but who reads that? Um, yeah, exactly. So session residents during internal orientation, faculty meetings, internal blog. Mm -hmm. Great. These are all great. These are all great ideas. Um, one of the other things that I've done, which I think I'm going to be infamous for, is in our bathrooms on our um, uh, departmental floor, I've put bulletin boards um, and I, I pin little um, uh, faculty development things on the bulletin board in the bathroom. So I, I'm shameless and relentless when it comes to faculty development. And I think what we see from this long list is we're all doing all sorts of things to get the message across emails faculty meetings grand rounds education retreats um you know resident orientation um you know all of these things bulletin boards so but then one of you raised a good question so you can bring a horse to water but you can't make them drink so um it i'm assuming i'm not alone if i say I do all these things. And then when you go to ask the faculty member if they know what the supervision policy is, they look at you like they have, like you have three heads. Um, so anyone have ideas for how to um, actually get faculty to engage in the material and embrace it and apply it. And so I'm wondering if people have ideas on that because that's the, to me, the bigger problem. Any thoughts? How do you get your faculty to engage in this? So one of the, I saw one of the questions when we were wondering, what do, want, what do people want? How do you get faculty buy-in? Anybody got good ideas for that? This is Carl Heisch. I, uh, I used to be at Vermont, at least. I was on faculty there for years. I yes. still, I'm in the South though. I, I think part of it, and I'm not trying to blow smoke, but I think part of it is, it's dependent upon the faculty member whether or not they really want to play ball is one. And then if you've got some interest, um, then I think that, that you can uh, make it work. I think so far as resident teaching, I think that that's a little bit easier for surgery faculty. Um, and we have a number of our residents who are very interested in teaching medical students. That part's easy, uh, but it's the ones who come and either junior faculty and so overwhelmed with their clinical load and academics to get them to buy in is very tough. So I think it's partially picking your target to a degree. Yeah, you'll have more success if you pick a target that is already intrinsically motivated or um, passionate about med ed, exactly. Yeah, I, I think, um, and we'll talk more about this later, there's, you know, certainly we've done a lot of things with rewards, which I'd be interested to hear what some places are doing for rewards. So you know, teaching um, uh, Apple teaching pins at the end of every clerkship, uh, one at the end of the entire clerkship. Um, some places are doing monetary things, which not everybody is able to do, but um, educational RVUs for rewards. Um, we're certainly not able to do that, but one of the ways that we've really tried to um, help with engagement is to create a career path. Um, you know, to, uh, to have a, a associate clerkship director position and a clerkship director, an associate PD and a PD, a vice chair of education, positions in the dean's office, somebody who oversees the AI. So if you create these sort of um, leadership positions um, and you create a pathway towards um, career advancement in medical education, that's been probably our most sustainable and most um, 
uh, successful way of um, getting people to engage. Um, great. So I'm going to move on just in the interest of time because we have lots of things to discuss today. Um, so then these are all the roles that we all love, right? So this is what you thought you were getting into when you signed the thing that said you're going to be the clerkship director or the level director or the director of the intercessions group or whatever, whatever medical education job you took, you were like, I'm going to you know, create strong learning experiences. I'm going to develop objectives and integrate the curriculum. I'm going to make sure the feedback is top notch and we have high program evaluations and student outcomes. And, um, you know, I'm going to have such a robust faculty development and this incredible network of people to work with. Um, and so, um, you know, again, this is overlaps with the conversation we just had is that, you um, it's one thing to create the material. It's another thing to actually get, um, you know, people to engage. Um, so again, just interested from the group, um, are, what are some creative or innovative things that you're doing to, um, you know, maybe network with certain groups like networking with residents or networking with students and residents um, so if you can think of like the most creative or innovative thing that you're doing in your course um, that you think is working, we'd love to have you put it in the chat or share it with the group. Um, Jill or Celeste, do you want to share something that you're doing to get the group chatting? I use incentives to drive evaluation return by setting a due date and then if they complete their evaluations by the due date, they become a shining star, which has evolved over time. It started off as over OVA achievers and they would get like ovarian cancer awareness type paraphernalia. Um, but now we know uh, for every individual faculty and resident what their favorite snack is. And we now match it to the favorite snack. And we provide that snack to the shining star in their uh, mailbox. So. Oh, that, that is awesome which drives turnaround time for our grades. And um, we are fortunate to be able to have our grades out um, very quickly because of it. Excellent. Celeste, what are you doing innovative and creative at Harvard? Well, uh, I don't know that it's innovative or creative, but it definitely uh, draws on people's uh, motivation for snacks. Um, <laughs> the So we ask students to nominate a faculty and a uh, resident uh, shining star teacher uh, for each rotation, um, but the deal is you can't. You can be nominated, but you can't get the award unless you've completed your evaluations. So, and we give out um, a little coffee cup, and it has, you know, M and M's or jelly beans or whatever in it. Uh, kind of going. We don't know everybody's snack preferences, Jill. That's that's going pretty far. <laughs> but food motivation and wards, I think, really do help a lot. And and just that public record. So and we announce it at Grand Rounds. So that public recognition that, you know, the, these are the people who are really going that extra mile towards um, contributing to the educational environment. Yeah, great. Do we have ideas in the chat from anyone or anyone want to share something really neat that they're doing um, as it relates to one of these roles in their course? I see the chat. How do I fund um, my incentive program? That's out of the Jill Sutton fund. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that is, that's a really challenging question. One of the things I've done that is not out of my own personal fund is that we um, have a educational retreat every year. So an annual retreat from 7 a.m. to 1 p.m. Again, this idea of trying to elevate medical education as our fourth pillar, you know, so you've got the clinical mission, you've got the research mission, you have the education mission, you have the service mission, um, and to really edu uh, elevate it. And so we had a research retreat forever. And so we added an annual education retreat um, and we do um, come together as a learning community for students and residents, faculty, our community and our academic faculty all come together um, and have, um, you know, a retreat that is um, from seven in the morning to 1 p.m. Um, 
and you know talk about things like formative feedback versus summative feedback talk about assessment give awards um, have posters that are med ed posters that students and residents have done or presented elsewhere to highlight sort of things that we're doing um, so that's just a another idea of um, sort of faculty development but also networking um, that's worked at our institution um, so again, in the interest of kind of keeping the discussion going, um, so you know, I, I think the role of clerkship director is critical. Um, but again, I, I would argue that we focused too much just on the clerkship director, and I think that it's really important for us to recognize that these roles they, that they've listed for the clerkship director they really include a, a lot of these roles residents are doing, um, a lot of these roles. Um, other you know, course directors are doing, um, and re it's really a medical educator um, roles. And we, we wanna be sharing our best practices, sharing our challenges, sharing our solutions, um, and thinking about it um, more, um, more globally, I think. Um, certainly we're all here because we found this to be rewarding. And I think that's one of the pathways to engagement or buy-in is to um, figure out how to, it's a little bit like two tramps and mud, mud time, you know, where you want to um, unite your avocation and your vocation. And if you can do that with faculty, um, you'll get um, engagement. Um, certainly resources and time are always problematic and money is one of those. Um, I think, again, if I had one message from this section, it would be that relentless faculty development is the key to clerkship bliss. And that's clerkship bliss for the student, that's clerkship bliss for the resident or fellow, that's clerkship bliss for the community faculty member or the academic faculty member. I, I truly believe that this is the way forward, which is again, why I probably got involved with Gary to set this um, in motion. So I'm gonna hand the next section off to my capable um, counterpart, Jill Sutton, to just talk about some of the day-to-day -day challenges we face in the clerkship. Hello again, I'm Jill Sutton from East Carolina University. It's so great to be here with all of you. Uh, we're gonna now move on to chapter two, um, day two, day to day management of the clerkship. Um, this chapter was written by Jenny Wright and Jean Cause Lucas. And the next slide. Oh, sorry. I was busy reading the chat, so sorry. <laughs> I didn't realize my job had changed. Sorry, here we go. <laughs> okay. I'll go back one slide. Um, we're gonna go through these objectives here. Um, we're gonna understand the day-to-day -day activities of a clerkship. Uh, we'll share best practices for successful clerkships, share common challenges facing clerkships, and we will do our best to network, problem solve, learn from each other on how to create an excellent clerkship. Uh, thanks to ACE, there's um, a great support for us to each have support in our roles as clerkship director. ACE recommends 0.5 FTE as a minimum for a clerkship director. Um, also the role of associate clerkship director and the clerkship administrator role is it's recommended to be 1.0 FTE as well um, site directors. All of these are members of what we call the clerkship team and how you would deliver and administer your clerkship. Uh, the clerkship teaching team includes your teaching faculty. Again, uh, to echo Elise, this requires extensive faculty development. Um, residents, fellows, we have to take our time to educate them as well in their role as faculty. And there is variability in residents as teachers curricula that, um, that others are using across specialties. Um, I wanna see the chat and make sure I'm not missing it. Um, do we recommend um, FTE support for site directors? Yes, you should advocate to get support for yourself as in your role. Um, of course, that would have to be navigated with your, um, with your chairs and um, with leadership at the school level. There is a document available, Ada, um, just recently published from ACE. Um, this came out in July. Um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Gary, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, brand new um, 2.0 clerkship director um, responsibilities um, 
maybe we'd be able to put the link to that new article in the chat. I'll, I'll go to that at the end of this, make sure I do that, Ada. Um, then you can have a document that says this in writing um, where you can get that support for the FTE. Okay. And don't forget, everybody else that is working with your learners in the space, they also need to be um, educated on their role. From the MAs to the LPNs to the RNs, the pathology, the anesthesiology co colleagues, if they work with PAs, nurse midwives, um, radiology colleagues, all of them would need to be in service on how to incorporate learners into the space and they too will be educating them as well. So this is also a plug for interprofessional education and interprofessional collaboration. So as you all know, LCME uh, looks to see that that is happening. And this is a way that you can prove that it's happening if you can document that it is. Ah, thank you, Gary. He put the link in the chat for you guys all to take that home to your home institutions to get support for your and I would just chime in and say that the IPE and IPC, not only as a LCME requirement, but it's a great way to address capacity problems. So, you know, we have too many students and not enough preceptors. And the more you empower these other teachers to engage in student education, it does relieve some of the capacity problems. Um, and just to give an example, so we had some learning environment issues in our operating room. And so a student with a faculty member um, is doing um, a project, a med ed project, and is going to um, do some education with the operating staff around medical students in the operating room. What kind of training do they have before they come? What are they allowed to do? What are they not allowed to do? You know, how to um, and our hope is, is that it will, one, improve the learning environment in the OR, but also empower the um, team in the operating room to really participate in education. And um, so there's lots of, this is a great solution for a lot of challenges that I think we see on a day-to-day -day basis. So we broke this also up into three different parts. What do you do have, what do you have to do prior to the start of a clerkship year? Um, how do you get ready for the next uh, years worth of um, learners coming your way. Well, you're going to want to solidify or develop all of your teaching sites. If you're in multi-site, um, making sure that all of your sites are ready, uh, ready to go. And you may need to evaluate if the clerkship director has the power to do this. And so um, you may need uh, help from those above you to um, gain access to other sites, et cetera. You're going to want to review and revise clerkship goals and objectives and make sure they're in line with um, your institutional learning objectives. And then uh, you're going to want to orient your faculty to clerkship goals, objectives, the teaching methods, feedback tools, and the rules and regulations of having students in the space. That's duty hours, supervision, billing, all of that. Now, prior to the start of the clerkship, if you have multiple sites, you'll have to, you know, put the students in those different spaces, and this could be by lottery. Uh, this is work um, closely with your clerkship coordinators and site directors to get placement for all of your learners. And then if there are multiple sites, you'll also have to make sure the students are credentialed to work in each of those spaces. During the clerkship, and what we're going to talk about for the, the last segment, um, Celeste Royce is going to take us and talk to us about student orientation, which is the key, getting your students off to the right, on the right foot, um, setting the tone for the entire time that they're on service is so important. So we're going to dig deep into that. Hold on to your seats. It's going to be awesome. Um, we're going to confirm during the clerkship that objectives are met. We call these required clinical encounters and making sure that they have a way to log those, proof that they actually did what we said we were going to do through our learning objectives. We're going to provide student feedback. This student feedback can, can happen continuously, but especially must happen at the midterm as per LCME requirement. Um, you're going to make sure you have educational sessions in place, whether those sessions are um, virtual, asynchronous, synchronous with the different sites that you are at. That's all really important to, to make sure you have a full plan for that. And then at the end, assessments, um, the shelf exam, um, the NBMEs, or your clinical skills tests such as OSCEs or clinical skills exams, and whatever other institutional exams you may provide, such as um, an oral exam, for example, uh, that you may or may not provide for your learners. 
And then once the students have completed all of the clerkship, then it's time for grades. Reviewing student feedback on the clerkship, addressing grade grievances, further developing your faculty, curriculum review and renewal, career advising for those learners that's identified that they may wanna follow in your footsteps, rewarding educators for using incentives to get them to do what we want them to do to help us with our educational goals. And then uh, faculty appointment, promotion, and then further site development. Oh, sorry. There you go. So now it's time for some interactive questions. We're going to use the chat, or if you want to unmute your microphone, you can get in there. We'll start with the first question. How do you balance continuity with a preceptor versus the variety? So this is trying, I think, kind of getting to a question that came through the chat. It's a little bit about capacity, right? Mm -hmm. It's a little bit about burnout. You know, um, before COVID, uh, faculty were taking a student for six weeks and happy to have them, you know, all day, every day. And now there's new demands and preceptors are maybe like, well, ah, maybe I just want to have them for two half days. So I'm just curious how people are, what sort of things are people doing to try and recruit or retain preceptors, either in their academic faculty or in their community faculty? We're trying a new strategy here at the University of Iowa. Um, like even in the clerkships, there's PA and medical students there that there is a main preceptor identified that has to be with the student at least once or twice per week to kind of get the continuity and see how the student is progressing. Mm -hmm. um, but particularly, and we have a lot of um, clerkships outside of the university that are community-based, we're encouraging there to be at least two preceptors at every site so that they can split the time um and give each other a little bit of break but yet there's at least one person that will always have them two days a week so you can get a little bit more accurate evaluation you can get a little continuity that they feel like they're touching bases and, and the students students prefer to have the same person all day i mean they want a wide breadth of experiences but they also want continuity so that's hard to balance but giving a little bit i think helps great thank you carol that's great other ideas from the group or other things that you're doing to sort of help with this problem? I mean, I think this is really core to the clinical experience because I think it's so important for students to have direct patient care um, and to have access to faculty and to not have all the education be um, done by the residents in the inpatient service. Um, and so I think this is like core to maintaining medical education or clinical education. So I think it's just a problem we really need to continue to have at the forefront and continue to try and solve. Other, does anyone else have other solutions? Anybody doing e, you know, like educational RVUs as a way to sort of pay for the time? At least we do do that, um, but it's it, the, it, effects of COVID have been, have been pretty tough. Um, one of the things that we've done to make up for it is um, some of our clinicians have uh, been, uh, in order to spread out um, time in the office, have been doing evening or Saturday clinics. And so, uh, you know, pairing students up with more off hours experiences, which are sometimes a little bit less um, uh, intense in terms of the number of patients that are present or that sort of thing. So they get a little bit more contact directly with the preceptor. Yeah, and I, um, the, someone in the chat just said something similar that, that they're sort of having these bursts of having students and then trying to give people a break and then bursts and then a break to try and relieve some of that. So sim similarly, the next question is, is related to, again, before COVID, we were doing everything in person. And then during COVID, we were doing everything um, you know, online and now, uh, you know, how are people, where, where are people landing in terms of delivering the educational 
materials are you are you liking to everything to stay online but have it be synchronous so they're zooming in all at the same time or are you liking asynchronous and how are you managing this um, for comparability across your different sites so just curious to hear what some people are doing as it relates to this well i can say we're a single site but um out of the covid um, we have five core lectures that were recorded and the students loved having access to those lectures at a time that was great for them versus having to all stay after nights and all be like half awake and all be present in the same room at the same time. Um, they asked us to keep that. They said that that was a positive that came out of COVID to have those five lectures be available to them, not in the way um, that we used to do it. So. Yeah, we have some pre-recorded material. I'm at uh, Innova Fairfax Hospital in Virginia, so we're a regional campus of UVA, and um, that it's been helpful to ensure compatibility as they are looking at the same lecture, and at the same time also promote some collaboration between the two sites where um, clerkship leadership and faculty can teach students on both campuses so that's one of the reasons why we did we are still retaining a couple of um, sessions um, cross campus um, while there is an effort to getting folks back to in person when um, it's possible the only worry that I have about pre-recorded lecture, which I think it's great when it comes to letting um, folks have access to it at different times, is that the learners tend to want to play double speed. You're right. Yeah, that's great. I, I do think that the this is one of the pandemic positives. Um, it's just it's allowed us to be more flexible. Um, and I think there, there's a lot of um, good that can come from that. Um, but I do worry about, you know, students potentially missing out on some of the like critical thinking or clinical reasoning that can come in a face-to-face -face discussion with, a, with an expert really um, drilling down to those clinical questions versus just watching an asynchronous uh, lecture for, or video. Um, so I, I think we, um, and I think having a balance is probably the way to go. Um, well, we in in surgery here, we've uh, been hard nosed. We have flipped classrooms for every lecture, and um, they are at four o'clock Friday. They have a week of uh, skills labs and and basic lectures. Well, lectures we call them, but but they are flipped classrooms. And um, we've done that because we felt that either remote or the lectures that the students would not interact with the data and ask questions. And so we've found large auditoriums um, and, um, and uh, have done that. And so far the feedback's been pretty good. So uh, it, may, it makes a lot of work for our coordinator. Yeah, that's, that's great. Miguel, did you have a comment? Yeah, for, uh, well, I'm in neurology clerkship in the University of Florida. We have moved our sessions, uh, teaching sessions are more like case-based and not lectures per se, but they're not uh, in our classroom anymore. They're all by Zoom. And I think that uh, has pros and cons. Pros is that the students don't have to travel to the you know, classroom to uh, be with a, a, a faculty member there. So they can save time because we have different sites, especially for clinics. So that saves them time. I think that's a positive. We can also have students from Jacksonville uh, or uh, satellite campus to join those Zoom lectures, those sessions. The, the, the negative is that obviously, I'm not sure if they're paying attention all the time. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, quite, sometimes when I ask questions, uh, there is a couple of two, three seconds of silence and then somebody speaks. It's hard to get them a little more engaged Unless you want to, you know, pimp them a little bit and go one by one. Sometimes students don't like that, but uh, well, I, you know, it's a trade-off. Yeah. Uh, saving versus uh, engagement. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, the only other one I want to ask at this page, because we've talked about some of the others, is just feedback. So I just went through an LCME visit here at UVM, and it was a fascinating experience um, opportunity. Um, <laughs> And so, you know, we collect a lot of feedback. I, I feel at least at our institution that we collect a lot of student feedback 
but we don't collect a lot of other feedback. Um, and so it's very, there's, a, there's very much a student voice to the feedback, which I think can have some biases to it. But um, so I'm just interested to hear like how um, at different institutions, people are collecting feedback on their course, you know, every rotation, and then are you reviewing it every rotation? Are you reviewing it quarterly? Are you doing it annually? Are you comparing like the OBGYN clerkship from two years ago to one year ago to this year? Or are you comparing across, you know, how does OBGYN compare to neuro to outpatient medicine? Um, and then how, I think maybe the most interesting question is, is how are you mitigating conflicting data? So, you know, when the LCME comes around, you send out this independent student analysis or the ISA that asks a bunch of questions that you may or may not have been asking in your other um, data sources. And so you get this feedback and then you have your clerkship or your course dashboards about, um, you know, that you're getting at the end of every rotation. And then you have this GQ, which is the student's recollection two years later about how their clerkship was. And, and the questions aren't the same and the data can be disc, um, not quite aligned. And I'm just curious how, um, what people are doing with this data and how are they utilizing it to, um, you know, for their course. Oh, we have an answer in the chat. Exit interview with each group and keep notes myself, review clerkship faculty feedback from time to time and more formal about doing it, sending it faculty emails. That's great. Um, that's great that you have an exit interview that requires a lot of time and dedication on your part. So kudos to you. <laughs> Um, other thoughts on how people are dealing with all this student data? We have a debriefing session every after every clerkship, so every four weeks for uh, students, you know, it's a group session. Uh, I, I do the session, but I, you know, sometimes the students, I, I don't think they voice all the concerns of feedback because I'm the clerkship director, obviously. There may be some conflict of interest there for the evaluation. But they also evaluate the clerkship uh, anonymously using new innovations. Mm -hmm. We pull mm -hmm. that data every, uh, we try to do every like three to six months. And I usually get an email from the Associate Dean of Education anyway about it. <laughs> and, yeah. And think, potential things to improve. Excellent. Does anyone ask their faculty about their course? Like, does anybody get a faculty feedback from about their course? Hmm. I've always wondered this because, it, it, like I said, I, there's only one voice in, in, in the data. And so I'm just curious if others are doing different things. Okay. Well, we're going to, in the interest of time, we're going to move on and um, we want to leave time for your questions at the end. Um, so I'm, I think our summary is, is that it takes a village. <laughs> Use your team, ensure that you have adequate support and resources, be well-prepared and organized, have well-prepared faculty and residents, have clear and open communication for student and educator concerns, and use feedback to reflect and create a CQI process to continually improve your clerkship. Okay, we're gonna turn it over to Celeste, Dr. Royce. Thank you, Dr. Everett. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that this uh, material was first put together by our colleagues, um, uh, Shreen Madami Sims and Maria Kelly, uh, who couldn't be here with us, but who are uh, in integral to having developed this material. So for the remainder of the time, we're gonna talk about clerkship orientation, which is the student facing part of all of this, right? So if we're talking about student-centered student education, this is the part that really matters. Um, to our learners. Um, all of this other stuff is kind of behind the scenes to them. And what really counts in their mind is like, where do I, where do I need to go? When do I need to be there? How are you, how am I going to be assessed? How are grades as, uh, assigned? Um, the nuts and bolts of the, of the rotation itself. So we're going to talk quick, quickly about um, how we can do an effective orientation without overburdening our students with too much information. Um, but the, the goal should be to allow students to walk away from your, from your orientation, understanding the learning goals and objectives, understanding the assessment, understanding their roles and responsibilities, 
and then understanding finally how they will be able to about again evaluate and give feedback on the rotation because you want this to be a two-way street in terms of of communication so we can go to the next slide um, and a clerkship orientation should cover some basic points um, including professionalism um, particularly with the with the um, with covid like what are students expected to wear in in the clinical spaces is it okay to show up in scrubs to places that maybe you didn't go in scrubs before how do you deal with ppe you know those kinds of things are very um very basic perhaps to us but students really need help in understanding those kinds of things um, how do we talk about social media? When do we get out our, our devices in front of patients? Those kinds of things also can fall under professionalism. We wanna establish a safe and um, effective learning environment and a welcoming environment. So making sure that your students understand uh, the ways that they can communicate about potential episodes that they find uncomfortable. How can they debrief either with residents, with peers, with uh, clerkship leadership? Um, if there are other channels at your institution for um, addressing um, concerns that they might have uh, about uh, harassment, mistreatment, or abuse. Um, recognizing that uh, students um, are, need to be appropriately supervised and um, assuring them that they are going to have that, that they're not gonna be left off to dry, that they're going to have people that are going to guide them through this experience, but at the same time, hold them to high enough bars that it's worth, worth their while to study and apply themselves um, in a manner that's going to, to improve their learning and make them better doctors in the end. Particularly in some fields where you have students that maybe, mm, they're not, they think they're not gonna go into your field um, and they're just gonna do the bare minimum, inspiring them to uh, really invest the time and energy to get everything out that they can. I oftentimes in my orientation will compare um, the clerkship year to being an undergrad, right? Like this is the time in your life where you get to sample everything. You need to just, when you're on neurology, be a neurologist and really get everything you possibly can out of that. So that um, when you go forward to be whatever you're gonna be when you grow up you have that background and understanding as to what your colleagues lives are like just like we did in undergrad we got to take you know literature and ethics and science and you'll never have a chance to go back and do that again so embrace it while you're there um, so we also want to set specific learning objectives like what are and these are going to sometimes come from your your school sometimes from a clerkship committee. Um, rarely are you going to have to develop those on your own, um, and if if you are there are resources available usually through your society that can help you to do that. Um, if, there, if you have specific expectations for your students along the lines during um, the clerkship, spell them out in detail. For example, we have a six week clerkship um, in OBGYN and we have um, an uh, uh, HMP that's due that, that, that they've done on their own that we want them to turn in by the end of the first week. We have some independent study modules that they need to have completed by the end of the mid clerkship uh, meeting. They have some other uh, materials for clerkship rounds that they have to present either in the second or the fourth week. Very concrete um, tasks that are due at specific times. And you want to be really explicit about how you explain what those are. Um, students also need to have limits put on. Um, so for their clinical experiences and responsibilities, you know, when do they need to show up? When is it okay for them to leave? Do they have to do overnight call or weekend activities? Um, and highly important, when are your exam dates? Usually, again, that's going to be set, especially for a shelf exam, it might be set centrally and you might not have any control over that. But then if that's the case, reassuring your students, they are excused from clinical duties during that time and for whatever prep time or wellness time you give them before or after that. Um, then in enabling your students to participate in self-directed learning and, and setting some expectations around that in terms of focusing their learning on patient care and calling out. If you see a patient with an interesting condition, research that, look into it, let that spark your curiosity and, and your inquisitiveness. Maybe use that to teach your peers or your residents or your team um, a little bit more about you know, the insulinoma that uh, no one is ever gonna see again. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, 
It's also a chance to promote um, a little bit of uh, metacognitive uh, um, activity for your, your students. So reflecting on their performance, asking for feedback, applying that feedback to how they are, are um, performing in their next uh, clinical encounters. Um, and then really emphasizing that the clerkship year is a time of professional development. And they go from being really neophytes in medicine to being socialized to being, being physicians. And that's, that's a big part of what they're trying to accomplish. So in helping them to see that, again, investing in your clerkship is important um, for their entire professional development. And it will only do them good to, you know, put as much effort as they can into it. Um, you wanna review how they're going to interact with patients. For example, if it's, you know, are they going to be taking over uh, complete responsibility? Are they expected to, to be going to the level of, of a sub I? Um, or are they really gonna be shadowing in some clinics? Again, setting expectations so that they're not disappointed in what they're going to um, be involved with. Again, back in, in my field of OBGYN on labor and delivery, are they gonna be expected to deliver the baby or are they just gonna be standing in, the, in you know, third person in line? In the REI clinic, they're never gonna do anything. They're gonna go there and watch, right? But, but maybe they could take the history from a patient. Um, in the OR, how involved should they expect to be? Are they gonna be closing so, the port sites or are they, again, just gonna be watching it up on the big screen? Um, so those are all important things to think about is establishing what the expectations for their interactions with patients are going to be. Um, some um, uh, patients may decide that they are not interested in having medical students involved in their care, or there may be patient care activities that are inappropriate for a student to, to participate in. For example, an exam under a pelvic exam under anesthesia on a trauma, a patient who has a history of trauma. Explaining to a, a patient or to a student that they may be invited to participate in some activities, but patients ultimately, for medical students anyway, do have uh, kind of the right of refusal, where the where patients may not have that with residents because residents, as licensed physicians, um, are you know in, entrusted with people's care, um, and then you want to be really solid about uh, mistreatment. Um, go over your policies. Here, uh, we have a big slide that says, we have a zero tolerance policy for mistreatment, harassment, and abuse. Um, and we really try and live up to that to improve our, our learning environment. So, um, great. So we can talk a little bit more about some of the specifics um, about a learning, your um, learning objectives for your course. Um, here we have um, a, set of 18 topics that we wanna to cover. Um, and you may have a, a, you know, a diagram like that. We also have procedures and skills that we expect students to um, be exposed to and demonstrate competency in. Um, and that's different for each one of our clerkships. Um, it may be that you use EPAs and trustful uh, professional activities at your school. And if so, that's, a, you know, that's a, uh, another way of uh, having a checklist to make sure that students understand where they are on their developmental process. Um, and the EPAs provide a framework for that that um, is, is kind of more evidence-based perhaps than some other frameworks. Um, so we can talk more about that if, if people are interested. Um, what are the expectations for oral presentations and for uh, documentation of clinical encounters? Are students expected to write notes? Are they expected to pre-round? Um, all of those things are important to go over with your students in, in the uh, very brief time you have with, in orientation. You want, to do, you want to talk about when they should expect feedback, how it's going to be structured, um, identify to them that you know, feedback is going to be given all the time and they may not uh, necessarily identify it themselves as feedback. Um, that again gets back to a little bit of faculty and resident development in terms of teaching techniques. Um, but know that the students should know that they will receive formal feedback at mid-clerkship and at exit interviews, um, that if, they're, if you use um, any kind of like simulation tests or um, many um, uh, clinical examination tests, CEXs, that when and how those are gonna happen. Um, we give our students little uh, lanyard cards that have um, scripts about how to ask for feedback um, using the, the um, little mnemonic of ready, um, reflect, elicit, 
Mm, I, I won't remember all of them, but <laughs> but at any rate, it's a way of, of prompting students to, you know, think about how they need to be involved with feedback. The, the why I know stands for you. You are integral to it. Um, so um, the grading policy should be clear, transparent, uh, and as objective of, as possible. They should also be somewhat consistent across your, your institution. Um, and that might be a, a place where you need to work with your other clerkship directors or other clerkship administrators across specialties to ensure that there is um, um, kind of a level playing field that the expectations are more or less similar in terms of um, achievement level that students are expected to have. And again, having a framework like EPAs or something else in that, that vein will go a long way towards making sure that all the clerkships kind of have the same level of expectation of effort. Um, Providing resources for learning and whether those are online resources, whether they're video resources, whether you give out textbooks or loan out textbooks, um, all of those different ways of getting students to get away from just doing question banks. Um, super, super important that they understand that those um, are, are available to them. And I, I am explicit in my orientation about do not rely completely on question banks. You will not do well and you will not become a good doctor if you only use question banks. It's just not a good form of learning. I don't know if I'm heard, but I say it loud and clear. Um, and then um, finally, if there are some specialty uh, clinics or rotations available in your clerkship, for example, if there are, you know, on a longer clerkship, if there are two week selectives that they can do, you wanna highlight those. Um, in OBGYN, sometimes it's participating in family planning um, or reproductive endocrinology and fertility. Um, but make sure that your students have the opportunity to explore the areas of your field that they might be interested in that might spark their interest a little bit more than, than uh, the rest of it. So just to summarize, um, I've thrown a lot of material at you um, and it kind of goes along with, this, with the, uh, the top line there is err on the side of over-orienting. You want all of this material available to your students from the get-go and give them a copy of the slides. Um, students love to have a copy of the slides and they'll, they'll annotate it on their little devices. And if you give it to them beforehand, they can, they can have it to review during your orientation, um, but also available to them later um, as, as a document that they can have and that they've already made notes on. Um, so providing details and allowing the students to ask plenty of questions, um, trying to do it in person if at all possible. You know, clearly sometimes with COVID or other things, it's not possible, to, or, or if you have multiple sites, it might not be possible to do in person for everybody. But I, th I think that personal touch really allows students to feel welcomed to the clerkship and invite other people into your orientation. No one wants to sit and hear you talk for four hours. So have your clerkship coordinator come in and do part of it. Have re a resident come in and do, you know, a day in the life of kind of, um, you know, 15 minute talk. Um, if there's a rant, like in our offices, we have a, a, a glass front to our classroom. If someone's walking by, I'll say, hey, Dr. O'Brien, come in and say hi to people, um, just to help create that welcoming environment. Um, but this is, this is the chance that you have to set the stage for success in your clerkship. So putting a little bit of effort into making it a showstopper really will go a long way towards success in your clerkship. All right, I'll stop talking now. No, you've done, it was amazing. Um, so we do wanna stop here and give you, um, and I can hang on for you know another 10 uh, to 30 minutes, but we wanna open it up and give you questions to ask um, the three of us, but also to the group, um, if you've got um, specific questions that you're dying to know what people are doing um, to solve a particular problem. So we'll just open it up for questions. And then we've um, included our email contacts here if you want to have an offline conversation as well, because this is a lot to go through in an hour. Thank you for all who were able to attend. And uh, we totally understand if you have to go, but we, we're so thankful for your time with us today. I'll start with a question. Um, you know, I, I feel like a lot of the times, whether it's orientation or whether it's exit interview, you know, part of the reasons why we do it, um, besides getting real you know, time data, it's also to frame the narrative and frame the clerkship in a way. It's almost like I'm selling the clerkship, right? To say, remember, we are here to make you guys be a better doctors. We're not here for you to pass a shelf. And remember, 
you did a lot for your patients and hopefully some of that would prompt them to go through the clerkship with the right mindset and also prompt them to remember some of the things during the clerkship when by the time they fill out uh, their, their GQ. What are your thoughts in terms of things that we need to be better at explaining to our students in terms of why we do things a certain way? I think, I think that's a really great question. And I think that, you know, one that at least I wrestle with a lot, which I think sometimes has to do with the, the generational differences. Um, and um, it's taken me a little bit of time to, to sort of recognize um, how much I actually have to say explicitly um, to um, this particular generation. Um, and so I found that the, the more detail I provide, um, the better, um, better off things are. And so, you know, I, I do think we have to be very, um, you know, explicit about um, what we value, because I think we've created a system that says we value the shelf exam, um, when, when in fact, if you ask us, we don't really value the shelf exam. Um, but at least the way the assessment set up, you know, again, depending on where you are and, and your clerkship, you know, we've, you know, we've said the shelf exam is important. We've put a certain amount of weight on it. We've um, got all these didactics that are focused on um, knowledge and material to pass the shelf exam. Um, and if that's not really what's important to us, then we need to change the narrative and we need to start having conversations about I don't want you to memorize the 400 questions in the question bank. I want you to, to use evidence-based medicine. I want you to think critically and I want you to ask questions and be curious. And I want you to become a lifelong learner. And I want you to um, you know, learn the skills of uh, a physician and I, you know, I develop a professional identity. Um, and if those are the things that we really value, then I think we have to change the assessment system um, and, and figure out a way to um, acknowledge those, uh, those students are, who are doing those things and, and, and reward those behaviors. I think also just, you know, in demonstrating the, the passion that we feel for things that are not um, the, that are not tangible, right? Like our relationships with our patients, our relationships with our learners, our, our um, you know, our research interests, our interest in education, all of those things that we feel passionate about. I think that by, by demonstrating that and living that, we might, we're hopefully moving the needle a little bit away from those, you know, um, maybe towards a better hidden curriculum. <laughs> Than, uh, than the shelf exam and all that kind of stuff. And I think we're, we're seeing a shift. I think it's gonna take us a little bit of time um, before we probably fully see the benefits of the shift. But I think um, you know, some of the signs are like the pass-fail step one, pass-fail foundation. Some schools are going pass-fail clerkship. Um, some schools are going sort of more competency based. We're starting to look at portfolios and really like look at, let's not look at your knowledge in isolation of like how you did on a test, but let's look at your knowledge in the setting of caring for a patient um, and, and really having more assessments that are based in the workplace and more assessments that are based in sort of simulated work, like in a sim center with a standardized patient. Um, where you can really, you know, assess professionalism and communication skills and listening skills and um, and rapport and things like that. So uh, I'm I'm hopeful um, that you know we're going to see um, some changes that will result in that. And I think the students are driving it to some extent. I mean our students are very active in the curriculum and they're driving things like social determinants of health and interprofessional education and quality. And I think as we start to focus more on those things that, that really are 
um, you know, not so knowledge centric and much more like systems based that we'll, we'll see an improvement in, uh, in that. I don't know what, interested what others think. Other questions from the group? Oh, we got something in the chat. Just a thank you from Y. Um, any other questions from the group? Otherwise, we'll make sure that you get the slide deck. I saw a request for the ready card. We have to figure out what the R and the E and the A and the D and the Y stand for. We can get that to you. Yeah. Um, if you get that to me, I can get it to her. <laughs> yeah, the recording will be available. Uh, and we hope to see you at more of these uh, as we move forward. And we welcome your feedback. So please give us your feedback so that we can um, make sure you're um, getting good use of your time. Yeah. Wonderful. All right. Thank you, Jill. And thank you, Celeste, for your thank time. You. Gary, you. any uh Thoughts or feedback? Nope. Um, I just saw Miguel's question. Um, the upcoming ones, I'll be sending out notices on Dr. Ed and other places to um, make sure people know it. And, and I'm also updating the ACE website because we have a tab for or place for the webinars and the RSVP stuff will be there as well. So just keep checking, but we'll be getting that stuff done before the end of the month for October's. That's awesome. Great. Great. Nice job, ladies, as always. Oh, it was a joy. So nice to work with you. <laughs> nice to see you, Gary. Yes, you too. Nice to see you other than on Twitter. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Even when I'm on Twitter, nobody sees me because I'm like, what? I have to type it. Hashtag med ed chat. I'm like, yes. my arthritic yeah. thumbs. I can't do that with my arthritic thumbs. I'm like, that every time. <laughs> oh, I kept saying to my husband, I had my husband helping me. I'm like, I don't think they're seeing my my things. I'm really saying really good things and no one's commenting on it. No. And he's like, no, it's okay. And sure enough, later in the transcript, nothing is there. And I'm like, Sweetheart, I don't think anything got there. And then I talked to Helen Morgan. She's like, did you put hashtag med ed chat at the end? I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, it was no. just classic, like classic non-tech person mistake. Yeah. So even my daughter was like, she, my, she was just shaking her head. So, so I'll leave. Mm -hmm. All right. I'll